Last week I did a study in Genesis chapter 7 about the details of the flood of Noah. I do not believe that you know we have any idea as to how devastating this event was. Uh, the clips that I just showed you are from two recent floods. One was in India last year and the other one is from Spain just a couple of weeks ago. Okay, the one in India in particular, you know, because my friend, uh, Brother Stanley, who joins us on our shows sometimes, you know, he had visited there recently and he told me, you know, it was just like a war zone that literally like a whole mountain, you know, collapsed into a valley. That is how powerful these waters can be in these floods, as you can see for yourself. Now, I had speculated that at that time, in Noah's time, when the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open, the volume of water that rained down and came up from below would literally be like oceans of water. And they would melt the earth in a very literal way. So the earth was broken up in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. And this again is confirmed. That's what I love about God's word. That information we read in one part of scripture is confirmed in other parts, you know, sometimes more than one to give us some more understanding of what, you know, is being said or taught in one portion of scripture. For example, in Genesis 7:11, we simply read that uh, the windows, the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. Now it does say the great deep, so you know like the depth of the water and which means that the fountains would be at the bottom and the water to come up from the great deep would have to come up with such force would need to be applied to you know have it exploding upwards, it will literally melt the earth above it, okay? And then it says the windows of heaven were open. As we know, the windows of heaven are referring to the flood, the, the firmament, and the firmament that above the firmament are the waters, which you can read about many places in the Bible. So it's literally like, you know, the, the earth, uh, the sky opened up and oceans of water fell on the earth. What the result of that would have been, it would be far more devastating and destructive than what we saw even in these two video clips. And in Isaiah 24, 18, we read, And it shall come to pass, that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. See, this is again a very similar description to what is going to happen in the future yet yeah, this is referring to the time of the day of the lord so this is a future prophecy but it is comparable to what already happened in the past in genesis chapter 7. so what we are told is the windows from on high are open which is what happened in the time of noah the windows of heaven were opened the foundations of the earth do shake so i mean if the fountains of the great deep were broken up would it cause the earth to shake of course it would and then what is the result in verse 19 in Isaiah 24, we read, The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean and dissolved. Could we literally see the earth being dissolved in those two short clips that I played for you? If that can be done by a flood in these times, which is nothing in magnitude of power to what happened in the days of Noah, what do you think might have happened at that time? Again, as I said, we can only speculate but the magnitude of that event is totally beyond our comprehension because even as great as these recent floods have been, they cannot even begin to compare to what happened during the days of Noah. So let's now continue on into chapter 8 to see what happens once this flood and the waters were stopped and the earth began to dry. All right, let's continue on to Genesis chapter 8 and the heading... The first heading of the chapter, as you can see on the screen, it says, The flood subsides. So verse 1, And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. Okay? What we learn from here, as we did from chapter 7, chapter 6, etc., is that the action is always centered upon God. It is God who makes the decision, it is God who passes the judgment, and it is God who causes these events to happen. Okay? In these chapters, you can see Satan and the devil and all his 
spirits, etc., they're not even mentioned. Because, as I've taught you before, Satan was created to serve God's purposes. And uh, it is the purposes of God. Okay, that's it. And there are a lot of people that run around, you know, talking about Donald Trump or, you know, this person or that person or the Pope or something, that, you know, these are the powers in this world. No, they're not the real powers in this world. The real power in this world is not even Satan, all these called the God of this world. And they are called powers and principalities. But that is only because God has given them certain power and authority to do certain things when he requires them to do so. Okay. But remember always that it is God who tells us that, you know, everything, all things are created, created by him and for him. He is the author of every event that has ever transpired since the beginning of creation, including this flood of Noah. So he sent the flood and now he is the one that will cause this earth to become dry. So the waters assuaged, the, uh, the word assuaged means to subside, to abate, to decrease. It is a work, verb, H7918, uh, the word sakak in Hebrew, a, a verb meaning to go down, to get lower. It refers to a lowering of the great flood waters in Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. Okay, I already talked a lot about the, this event of how these waters you know, went down and what it means for how it has altered the geography of the earth itself. It looks nothing like what it did before the time of the flood. And that is in the study in chapter 7, so I'm not going to go into that here. But what we continue in verse 2, we learn is that the fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. So there are three things that happened to bring these waters on the earth, which greatly increased the volume of the water that existed on the earth. I believe in the beginning, in the time of Adam until Noah, the land mass of the earth was probably greater than or at least equal to the mass or the volume area that was covered by the waters of the seas that existed in that time, okay? I think that they were probably, the land was probably more and the water was less. But after the flood, it reversed. So a lot of that land, as we saw in that clip, it literally melted into the waters, okay? It no longer exists as solid, dry land. It has been sunk under the waters. So the land mass decreased substantially after the flood of Noah. And this also implies, because we are told that, you know, this water covered the whole earth, that the judgment was upon the whole earth. It wasn't that the population of these evil men was only limited to a certain part of the Middle East, for example. No, man had spread all across the face of the earth and they had built cities and civilizations everywhere. As we read about Cain, when he went to the land of Nod and started building a city there. So the earth was overspread with people, probably greater in number than exist on the earth today. So these waters, the reason they increased in volume was that it was not just the waters that came down in the form of rain. We are told clearly that they also came from below, which is the fountains of the deep. Now it is possible that these waters, the so-called fountains, these fountains were like reservoirs that may even have been sealed up until that time. And it is only after this time of the judgment of God's flood that they were opened up. And then of course, you know, once these reservoirs have been opened up, then the water would be on the earth. They are no longer, you know, they became a part of the earth, not separate from it as they might have been in the beginning. And again, that is just speculation. And also the windows of heaven that we told in Genesis chapter one, you know, God made the firmament and he separated the waters that were under the earth from the ones that were above it. So, you know, yes, half the waters, at least in my estimation, were carried, they were lifted up above the firmament. And that's where they stayed until this time of the flood, when the windows of heaven were open and they rained down. They came down upon the earth, not just in the form of rain, but in the form of a torrential, in the form of a deluge, in literally the form of like oceans just dropping straight down. Okay, and that, how devastating that would be. 
as we just saw from a simple little flood in Spain, you know, like a simple in comparison to Noah's and what devastation it caused. Can you imagine something like that, that the whole sky opens up and like an ocean of water falls down? What would it do to the world, okay? We can't even begin to comprehend, but that is exactly what happened at that time. And the third form of this uh, precipitation was rain. And that's why we are told that the fountains of the deep were shut, the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. So these three, there were three sources of water that greatly increased the volume of water on the earth. So verse 3, And the waters returned from off the earth continually, and after the end of 150 days the waters were abated. So we told in chapter 7 that these waters were so high that they were 15 cubits above the highest mountains, which means, you know, they were like literally like something like 20 feet or, or, or uh, you know, 3 meters above even the highest of the mountains. So then they began to, when God made this wind to pass across the earth, the waters began to abate and eventually they were, the, the, the dry land began to appear. So the waters returned from off the earth. So they were being removed off the earth into the lower regions once again, where they must continue until this day. And uh, after the end of 150 days, the waters were abated. So it was after the ark had already come to a standstill on Mount Ararat that these waters you know, continued to abate. And then the dry land finally appeared after 150 days. And the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. Okay, this again is a place we believe in Turkey and may very well be there is a Mount Ararat there and it may well be the same mountain, we don't know. You know, but uh, people say it is and it's, you know, I don't, I don't have any reason to dispute that. So that is quite possibly the place where this ark actually came to rest in those days. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. Okay. So the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. So the 10th month is that, you know, from the time that Noah went into the ark, from that time, 10 months passed by. And it was only on the first day of the 10th month that it said that the tops of the mountains began to be seen. So we have not yet reached the ground. The waters still have not abated enough that the surface of the sea level, let's say, is now become where it is today. No, the waters were still above it, but at least the mountains were beginning to appear at that time after 10 months of these five months, 150 days. You know, the rain had continued, the waters had continued to increase. And it is after the five months they came, then five months they abated and went into the ground again. And it was after 10 months that the tops of the mountains began to be seen. I think I was a little bit incorrect in those uh, dates and times. So let's go back into verse 3 and look at it again. And the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. So what this means is, that as we learned in chapter 7, that the world, the waters rose like 15 cubits upwards above the highest mountain. So, after 150 days, and the rain did not continue for 150 days, I was wrong about that. The rain actually rained for 40 days. So the waters that came up from below and above, it was like a period of 40 days. In those 40 days, the highest mountains were covered upwards of, like I said, the Bible says 15 cubits, which I believe is roughly around 3 meters or so, or about 20 feet. Okay, so after 150 days, that is after 5 months, the waters were abated enough that at least the very tops of the mountains began to be to appear. And it is then, not just after the 5 months of the 150 days, but later on, after two more months, two and a half more months had gone by. In verse 4 we read, The ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. Okay? So that's in the seventh month, which means like seven months had gone by, seven, more than seven and a half, because seven months and seventeen days, that finally that this ark touched land. Okay? That's when it rested upon one of these mountains. 
And then in verse 5, And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountain seen. So after five months, like at least the tops of the highest mountains began, began to come visible. So they, in, in those days, and then up to until that period of those five months, this ark was like completely above the land, okay? It was completely submerged in water. There was no land that it could touch, okay? After five months, the waters are abated, so I believe that at least they got closer enough to the tops of the highest mountains. After another seven months and 17 days, the waters had gone down sufficiently that this ark could now rest on land, but not on the land which is the ground level. It was that land which is on the top of the highest mountains. And this was in the mountains of Ararat, which I said is in Turkey. That's where it came to rest in modern day Turkey, that is. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. So even after the ark had come to a rest, it was still really not dry land that they could land on and start to, you know, go about planting crops, etc. No, it had not yet happened. So another two and a half more months went by. After that, the ark came to rest, that the tops of the mountains now began to become visible. Okay, at that point in time, what they were still seeing was water, although there was land below them, but all their sight, whatever they were visible to them, would still be water. But it was after the 10th month, when 10 months had gone by from the beginning of the flood, that the waters went down sufficiently. First, those 15 cubits, they were above the water, so they come down that 15 cubits. And then they keep on going down more, so at least the tops of the mountain ranges began to be visible. So we shall see it would require another two months until which time they reached down to the ground level that the waters had gone down sufficiently. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days. So after the 10 months, into the 11th month and 10 days, 11 months plus 10 days, that's 40 days, uh, would make 11 months plus 10 days. It came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. So up until this point, they had remained shut and sealed inside the ark. Still, for 11 months plus, they were sealed inside the ark. And I've spoken to you about this here, about the nature of the ark itself, that how it must need to, you know, like I was... Uh, <clears throat> I was reading something about this place called the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, which is the tallest building in the world. It's a residential building, has some like 160 stories. And uh, one of the stories story in it was that, you know, they have to do the, the, the waste that is produced. You know, we're talking about human waste is so much that every morning they, that there's, the building cannot actually dispose of it uh, automatically. So they have these trucks they come in every morning and they fill up these trucks, you know, like, I mean, literally hundreds of trucks with these, this waste and then it is shipped away. So the point here is that wherever there's going to be a group of people or beasts or animals, there's going to be waste, okay? And that waste has to be disposed of somehow. And that's what I had meant, you know, that this ark had to have many, many very sophisticated systems in it in order to be able to process the waste, to be able to process the food, to be able to, you know, to provide circulation and fresh air for the animals to breathe. Because after all, the judgment was upon the flesh and what God saved was the flesh at the time of Noah. Which is another study in itself, you know, that it's, it, the, the time of Noah was uh, that the, the, what God did in that through Noah was to save the body of man. It is not to save the spirit of man. The spirit of the soul of man was not what was saved. That was done by Jesus Christ on the cross. Okay, but through Noah in that ark, the body of man was preserved so that it could be continued up until Jesus Christ and beyond, I guess, but uh, until Jesus could come, who would be God in the flesh. So he would take the form of that flesh that was preserved in that ark. Okay? And therefore, wherever there is flesh, there have to be fleshly processes, bodily processes that need to be addressed. And that is what, you know, how that was done in this ark for a period of 11 plus years. I meant 11 plus months, not 11 plus years. One whole year. 
I do not know, with not just eight people, but also with like so many animals, etc. that we are, I have no idea how we would even begin to number them. Okay, and it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sent forth a raven, so that's right, up until that point, the ark was still sealed, and it was only after the 11th month that uh, Noah just opened a window, and he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Now, at this point in time, the waters, the land had not yet fully been dried right to the ground level. Okay, we are told that the tops of the mountains had begun to appear, but that means, you know, like at least more than half the mountains are still covered and the dry ground, which was far beneath them, had not yet appeared, okay? So verse 7, he sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth, okay? Now, it's uh, interesting that he sends forth this raven. Ravens were considered to be unclean birds, so they were not, uh, the Israelites were not allowed to eat them. But at the same time, you know, we understand that in the time of Elijah, God used the ravens to feed Elijah. So that goes to show us, you know, whether it's uh, an unclean animal or something that is unclean or evil, even like the devil, they all in the end serve the purposes of God and God can use them howsoever he chooses to do. Now, it is interesting that this unclean bird was the first one out of the ark and it went and it never returned again. And that is, you know, symbolic of eventually that evil is going to fly away, that all that is unclean is going to be done away with it and what will be left in the end is only that which is clean and holy. So that's all I have to say about the raven in this case but I'm sure there's you know maybe more significance to why it was a raven that was the first bird that uh, Noah let out of the ark but uh, you know if somebody else has some thoughts on it they can probably share it in the comments here. Okay so now we continue on to verse 9 and the dove no, verse 8, and he also, and he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. And verse 9, but the dove found no rest for the sole of her feet. And she returned unto him in the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. Okay. So the second uh, bird that he sent out of the ark was a dove. The dove, of course, is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, as, for example, we can uh, read in the Gospel of John that, you know, the John the Baptist saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove upon Jesus Christ. And the dove was, of course, a clean bird. It was not an unclean one, unlike the raven. So, in this case, this bird goes out, the dove goes out, and uh, it finds that the water is still covering the earth. Okay, although the ark had come to rest, that it was probably, you know, wedged against uh, the side of the mountain or something, it was not yet, the ground itself had not yet dried. Okay, so I'm sure, like, you know, when this uh, ark finally landed on the ground, it was as the water kept going down. I'm sure it key also kept coming down towards the ground level. I don't think it was hanging up in the side of the mountain when all the animals and Noah and everybody started to come out of it. That is not what the Bible teaches. So at that moment in time, however, there were enough water in it that this dove had no place to, to rest the sole of her foot. So she had to return to him in the ark, okay? So I believe, you know, we can also look at it in this way, that, you know, Noah, of course, was anointed a God, that he had, he was a righteous man, he was a man who walked with God, so obviously God's Holy Spirit rested upon him as he was undertook this great mission, which has probably been the greatest mission ever in the history of mankind, but uh, except, of course, the, the work that Jesus Christ later came to do, but this was also symbolic of the salvation of God that he wrought for man through Noah. So this dove means that the Holy Spirit was with him and it was his guidance that the Holy Spirit itself would guide him as to when it would be time for him to come out of the safety of that ark so then he could go back to the earth and begin to replenish it and to be fruitful and to multiply upon it. So then in uh, verse 10, 
So this is going to show us, you know, that it's going to be, I believe, another couple of weeks before the land was dry enough for this water, for this uh, ark to actually land on the surface and all the and Noah and his family and the birds to start coming out of it. And then he says, he stayed yet another seven days. And again, he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him in the evening and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So no one knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. Okay, so at this point in time, the waters had gone down sufficiently. Like when Noah's ark came to rest, it was at the top of the mountain. So by this time, you know, the olive trees are not like very, very high trees. So obviously, if this dove picked off a leaf from an olive tree, it means that uh, the waters had come down at least to the height of the trees. So they were almost down to ground level at this time. This is also interesting that it mentioned that it was an olive leaf that this dove plucked off. Now, generally speaking, people teach that this olive is symbolic as a symbol of peace, okay? That's like, you know, where you get the expression of extending somebody an olive branch, that it is a symbol of peace. But in, that's not, that is not necessarily true, that, you know, olives represent peace in the Bible, okay? Because... There are other association with olives in the Bibles, particularly with Jesus' ministry, because he spent a lot of time on the Mount of Olives, okay? And his most famous uh, teaching on the Mount of Olives is, of course, Matthew 24, which is regarding the coming judgment and the end of the world, okay? So, in that context, this olive is probably more symbolic of God's judgment than it is of uh, peace, Okay, that's why that, you know, God is showing, you know, his judgment has been passed. And now it is time for restoration and for replenishment and for the new to begin because God's wrath has subsided. So in a manner of speaking, yes, it symbolizes some type of peace. But at the same time, it is not just a symbol of peace, in my opinion, because in the end, Jesus Christ himself is going to return upon the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives is going to split into two. Okay? And it is only then that we are going to enter into the new age, which is going to be the new kingdom of, of God upon the earth, which is going to be after this Mount of Olives has been cut in half okay so i can like you know say for sure that you know an olive is a symbolic of symbol of peace as we are generally taught because everything we are usually taught is not right anyway so you know i would think that it represents more god's judgment but also his mercy because as his judgment follows his mercy follows that his judgment even was tempered with mercy because in the end, he didn't destroy everyone. Just in, this, in the Garden of Eden, God was merciful to Adam and Eve that he didn't destroy them right there and then. And that was the end of mankind. So too at this time of Noah, you know, God preserved Noah and his family to keep flesh alive upon the earth as well as the beasts and the birds and the fowl and, uh, you know, other creatures. So he was being merciful even though he was sending judgment. And that in the end is also going to be the case that, you know, when Jesus pronounced judgment upon that evil world, the whole world, as a matter of fact, you know, this is very similar to the time of Noah. He also continued to teach them that, you know, God is still going to be merciful, that he is going to cut those days short. Otherwise, no flesh would be saved, that he is still going to save some flesh. So this olive is both a symbol of God's judgment and also of his mercy in my opinion and that is why this dove the holy spirit you know brings this olive it is not just bringing us uh, peace and uh, the holy spirit does bring you know the and john taught it you know he brings uh, he's, he's going to convict you of sin so you know it the holy spirit warns of judgment all the time okay so it is not just peace everybody associates the dove and holy spirit with peace but the holy spirit is also god's warning Okay, he uses the Spirit of God, warns us all the time. So it's more than just to say that it is a symbol of peace. Okay, so that's enough said about this olive uh, leaf that this uh, that this dove had in her mouth. You know, and that also that you know that the earth was now dry enough that at least the water had receded to the that the tops of the trees had now become visible, not just the tops of the mountains. All right, so then we read that he stayed yet another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. 
So we had understood, you know, that uh, in the it was in the second year, like in the thirteenth month, or uh, that uh, he had actually the the ark had come to rest, and that's when he opened this window that he had made in the ark, and then he sent out this raven, and uh, also the dove. But the dove returned to him, but the raven did not. And then you know he waited another seven days, and then he sent out the uh, the dove again. So after the seven days, the dove came back and it had this olive leaf in her mouth. And then he waits another seven days. And then he sends out this dove once more. And then it tells us that the dove would not return not again unto him any more. Which again tells us, you know, that uh, this time, that the work that uh, this judgment of God had now finished. And therefore it would be now time to begin the new. The old had disappeared you know as in the in the coming judgment of god god is going to destroy this old creation he's going to make a new one so same thing here you know at this point in time you know what the work that was in the the, the dove stain with noah in the ark it had been finished and now he would go forth out into the earth and of course that doesn't mean you know that the dove had departed from noah that he was no longer appointed he was no longer a preacher of righteousness that's not what that means that you know his work would now continue on the surface of the earth okay so the dove and he stayed yet another seven days verse 12 and he sent forth the dove which returned not again unto him anymore and verse 13 it came to pass in the 601st year that is the 601st year of noah's life in the first month the first day of the month the waters were dried up from off the earth and noah removed the covering of the ark and look and behold the face of the ground was dry so again as we learned before you know that this ark had been sealed it had been sealed by god but i suppose it had some sort of mechanism on the inside from which noah would be able to open it and first he had opened the window and he had determined that the ground now was dry once he saw the olive leaf and they waited another seven days so, you know, at that moment in time, even if it was only the tops of the trees that had uh, the waters had receded to, but now, after another seven days, you can see how rapidly these waters are now receding, that, you know, the ark had now come to rest upon the dry ground, and therefore it was time for Noah and the animals to come out of the ark. It came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. So, this is the covering of the ark. Again, proves that this ark was a sealed vessel. And as I mentioned before, you know, that it, it therefore it required certain technological aspects to it, such as, you know, air circulation, etc., which I'm not going to repeat here, but being a sealed vessel and having so many, you know, uh, creatures, including man, living in it, it would definitely not be possible without like fresh air, fresh water and all those kind of things. And God, and in the second month on the 7th and 20th day of the month was the earth dried. So at this point in time, when he opened it in the, in the first month of the 600th year, which means, you know, one whole year had gone by, the ground, the ark had come to rest on the ground. But, you know, I was assumed that this ground was still wet. It wasn't like quite dry ground, okay? It is in the second month, okay? In the second month, on the 7th and 20th day of the month, was the earth dry. So the ark came to rest on the surface of the ground in the first month of the 601st year. But it was another month and 27 days, almost two days, two months longer, before I believe the earth was dry enough that Noah and the animals could actually venture out of the ark. And God spoke unto Noah, saying, So God had told Noah when to enter the ark, and now God is going to tell him when to come out of the ark. And this is again, you know, like all through Genesis, from the very first verse, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created. It's all about the Creator. And you know what, what really saddens me, that people are always trying to make it about Satan, about this man or this person or that person. That is not what the Bible is about. It's about the story of God. It is the Word of God. It is God who is always the one that is in control, no matter how many evil creatures that exist in His creation, which He has all created for His to serve His own purposes. It is only one Creator, and it is only one author of creation and he is the one 
that is always in control. We should keep that always in mind. And God spoke unto Noah, saying in verse 15, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife, and thy sons, and thy sons' wives with thee. So now, you know, the ground is obviously dried. The ark is resting on the ground. I think it's no longer hanging up in the side of the mountain where it first came to rest on the earth. And now it's time for everybody to come out of there. In verse 17, bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh. See, that word flesh is used so much in here. And yet people make this all about Genesis, you know, 6 and the flood about evil angels, evil spirits, Nephilim demons, you know, such things. And uh, all false and incorrect. That is not what the Bible teaches. Noah was used by God to save the flesh, the body. Because God himself was going to assume bodily form later on through Jesus Christ. But he was not. This was nothing to do with the spirit. The spirit of man remained evil. It was evil. We shall read again about the imagination of the hearts being evil. We shall read about that in Genesis 6 and again I believe in Genesis 9 God repeats that same thing so the heart of man remained evil even after the flood it didn't become suddenly pure and cleansed no it didn't all right so the cleansing of the heart would take place later through the blood of Jesus Christ at this point in time all God was interested in was to preserve flesh and that's why we read in verse 17 bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh both of fowl and of cattle, and of every creepeth, creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth, and be fruitful, and multiply upon the earth. Same blessing is going to be given to the Noah and the beasts as it was in Genesis chapter 1. So this is again a rep, uh, what, what we were told there. God said to Adam, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. This is going to be the same blessing that God is going to bestow upon Noah. Which again, you know, proves to you that Adam also had come into an earth that had been destroyed in the past because of God's judgment, which was a far greater judgment than in the days of Noah. And he was commanded and he was instructed to be a replenisher a rebuilder and a restorer of the earth uh, just as it happened with Noah. So there are a great deal of similarities between Noah's uh, flood and the flood of Satan that came before the history of which I have taught you know, many, many times in the hundred plus teachings I have on the history of the real history of creation in the Bible, including teaching about the gap fact that Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, there's a great gap of time in which the history of evil on which I've done a long series, you know, it falls between those two verses. And without understanding that that's when evil and darkness began was long time before Adam. See, although there are many similarities between uh, the time before Adam was formed in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 2, especially verse 2, where we read, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, you know, that there is a flooded earth. Uh, yet, uh, we people, you know, sometimes they think about this as the time of Noah's flood or, uh, you know, that it is the same events, uh, something which happened after Adam had been formed, or this is how God created the earth in the beginning. That is not the case because, you know, I don't want to go into this gap uh, fact that, you know, there is a gap of time and the history of evil on which I have a 15 part series, uh, you can study that to understand that, you know, this, uh, the evil, the story of evil of the evil angels or the evil sons of God, or the evil beasts led by Satan, it all falls between Genesis chapter one, verse one and verse two. So what are the similarities and differences that teach us that this is Genesis one and the flood of Noah are two different times. And uh, we can learn much about the history of creation by comparing these two and understanding the difference in these times. Uh, for example, we can read in, uh, in verse 2, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. This would be comparable, you know, what happened in the time of Noah when he sent forth the dove, which is symbolic of the Spirit of God, you know, that it goes out and surveys the water-covered land once more. And then it is in bringing that olive leaf that Noah is given a signal that the earth has now dried and is ready to be re-inhabited. 
And this is again at the same time the Spirit of God at the time of Satan's flood went and surveyed the damaged creation and decided when it would be time for it to be replenished, to be refurbished, to be restored and to be renovated once again to make it habitable. And that happened in verse 3 of Genesis 1 when God said, let there be light and there was light. Okay. Now the difference that I want to point out to you here is what happened to the waters in these two situations. In the case of Noah, we were told that the waters kept abating, kept abating. Time frames are given, you know, what happened after like five months, what happened after 10 months, what happened after a year, etc. But in the case of Satan's flood, which we read about in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, you know, we are told in verse 4, for example, God in verse 6, I mean, in Genesis chapter 1, we read, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. So the, word, the waters did not abate. The water, the earth remained watered, covered. In order to make this earth dry, what God had to do was to take the waters that were on the surface of the earth, and put it above the firmament. So God makes the solid roof above the earth, which is like the bottom of a pool, and they took the waters, half the waters off the earth, and he put them up there. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmaments, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. So in this situation, the water that was so much greater, because I told you that this judgment was not just upon the earth, it was also upon the heavens, that it had, because the sin of the angels and all the other evil creatures at that time, it had spread all across God's creation on the earth and also into the heavens. So the judgment that was passed at the time of Satan's flood was far greater than at the time of Noah, because it was a judgment upon evil itself. Okay, so this water volume was far, far greater, and that's why there was no place for it to recede to. This is the reason why God had to lift it up off the earth and place it above the firmament. Now, some of these waters, when the windows of our whole heaven were open, they rained back down upon the earth, which is why the volume of water on the earth once again increased, but it did not increase to the same levels as it was in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. So that was a little bit of a digression, but the purpose of that was to teach us that you know, in, in, in Bible, there are many passages of scripture that may seem to be similar and people generally, you know, mix them up one with the other. But it is only in studying all of those in detail, looking at each of the words and comparing them that we come to understand that in many times they are actually referring to different times and different events as for example, or even different people, as for example, a lot of people teach that uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah chapter 14 about the same person named Lucifer, but that is absolutely not correct. So from verse 15 into 19, you know, it's about Noah and his family and the beasts coming out of the ark onto a dried earth. In verse 15, God spoke unto Noah saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth and his sons and his sons' wives with him, and every beast every creeping thing and every fowl and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. Okay, this principle that this earth has been created for to be fruitful and to be multiplied for multiplication of every kind of creature that God has placed upon it, it is you know taught us right from Genesis chapter 1 once again. This is the same blessing that was given in Genesis 1, which is again being God is blessing Noah and all these other creatures that were with him to go out and to be fruitful and to breed abundantly in the earth and to refill it with life. Okay, the earth has been created for life, the life of the flesh, the life of the body. That is what the earth is for. And that is another teaching that we learn from here is that, you know, being that it is for creatures of flesh, 
you know, this whole teaching about angels, spirits coming down and just, you know, nilly willy trying to, you know, mixing themselves up with flesh, it is not biblical because spirits cannot come and just, you know, start mating and having children with the, with the creatures of flesh. It is an impossibility. And therefore, you know, we should put those ideas out of our head once and for all and not believe in evil documents such as the book of, uh, book of Enoch, but rather actually study what the Word of God is teaching us and the word flesh and the multiplication of flesh that is taught all the way from Genesis chapter 1 right back into here in Genesis chapter 8. Finally, in uh, verses 20 to 22, it tells us God's covenant with Noah. Uh, this actually, I think, is not a covenant here. This is a promise that God makes. You know, the covenant we'll read about in chapter 9. But what did, in verse 20, we read, And Noah built it an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Okay, so this year, when we are read that, you know, the clean animals came into the ark in sevens, you know, they are one of the possible interpretations is that it was seven pairs. What the other one, it could be that there were actually seven of each clean beast, seven in number, meaning that there were three pairs of, uh, you know, a, a male and a female, and then there was an extra male, which probably was what Noah used for this offering unto the Lord, which again teaches us, as I've told you, right going back to Cain and Abel, that, you know, some type of uh, religion, some type of religious service of God, it had already been taught to the people of Adam, right from the days of the Garden of Eden. And they knew about it. That's why they brought offerings, even animal offerings. And we shall understand that, you know, people teach that, you know, the eating of meat began after the time of Noah. But I think, you know, probably not. I think they were already eating it before. And now it is that God is going to sanction it as food. Whereas prior to the flood, you know, he was, uh, a man had been told that he should only eat the food of the trees and of the herbs of the ground. But uh, at this time here, that uh, diet is changed, but that does not mean that, you know, the meat eating actually began after the flood of Noah. I think it was already going on before them. That is the why they were used to having these sacrifices and offerings, which Noah obviously knew about, and he must have done so before the flood, that, you know, he was able to, right after the flood, to be able to do that immediately. And Noah built in an altar unto the Lord. Again, this idea of building an altar, offering a sacrifice upon it, it tells you that right from Genesis chapter 3, where Jesus, where God said that, you know, the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent, that, you know, they understood that a sacrifice would be made one day, which was going to bruise that evil and to destroy it, okay? And therefore, they had no problem in offering these sacrifices as did Abel in, uh, of his flock, in Genesis chapter 4, and now Noah is doing the same thing. So this is not something new that they have learned. They had already known about it. They understood it, and they practiced it even in the days before the flood. So Noah built it an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Altar, what does the word altar mean? A masculine noun meaning the altar, the place of sacrifice. And, you know, so this is, uh, again, pointing all these sacrifices all throughout the New Testament, which people think, you know, began in the days of Moses, then they did, did not. They began a lot earlier than that, even, like I said, going back to the days of Adam and Eve. And these all obviously pointed to the perfect sacrifice of the perfect spotless Lamb of God, which alone would be able to take away the sin of man, that these sacrifices of animals were symbolic of the removal of sin, but they only covered sin up. They couldn't take it away from the conscience and the heart of man, which only the blood of Jesus can do, as we read about in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Okay, and the Lord smelled the sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, this is a nice, right, sweet savor. This is this incense and smells. You know, there's something else we can learn from it, that you know how magnificent it is that God has built, like you know, even the body that he has made for us, that we can smell and we can taste, and we can touch, that all these sensations, they are wonderful, or they should be wonderful. And this is also how God himself experiences these things as pleasure or as pain. In this event, it was something that was pleasurable to him. That's why they burned this special incense in the temple, because it, it brings sense forth a sweet odor. 
which is pleasing to the soul and to the mind. Okay, it is tranquilizing. You can read this here, smell a sweet. Sweet, it says soothing, quieting, tranquilizing. So God's heart, of course, has been has been buffeted. It has been in turmoil because of all these evils and sins that he knew he would have to deal with. And it is through the sacrifice he knew himself that in the end all that evil would be removed and what would be left would be the peace and quiet. Not just for himself, but all those who would be his family and his children. And the Lord smelled the sweet savor. That's why the incense in the temple burnt constantly 24-7. They had incense that was burnt in the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the Lord smelled the sweet savor, scent, fragrance, aroma, odor, odor of soothing, technical term for sacrifice to God. And the Lord smelled the sweet savor and the Lord said in his heart, See, this is again, we're telling, you know, the people teach you, you know, like, for example, in this Bible, which I'm reading from, which is the ESO software, they have put a heading up here. It says God's covenant with Noah. But this is not God talking to Noah. Here we are being told that God said this in his heart. So this is something God is telling himself that, you know, yes, this has happened. The earth has been destroyed, but he is telling himself that he is not going to do something. So the covenant with Noah is going to come later in chapter 9. And the Lord smelled the sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. So, you know, the cursed is the ground for thy sake, and Adam was told in Genesis chapter 3. And everybody tells us, you know, God cursed Adam. No, God didn't curse man. God, If God had ever cursed man, man would have been finished right there. And then God cursed the earth that it was going to produce thorns and thistles. And it was going to be unproductive, that it was not going to give man the strength of its produce, of the bounty that it should have produced, okay? That there would be labor and toil that would be involved in producing food. So it was the earth that was cursed, not man. So what did the God say in his heart? I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Did I not tell you? that before the reason for the flood was that the heart of man was evil. But after the flood, what do we read? Did that evil disappear? Noah was a perfect man, so everything was fine? No. The evil continued. God had preserved flesh because he needed flesh to be preserved, but the heart of man still remained evil, and it would not be cleansed until Jesus Christ, the sacrifice, the perfect Lamb of God, was sacrificed at a much later time. And I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, and neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. So that is, a, that is, you could say, a promise that God made to himself, that he was not going to curse the ground anymore for man's sake. And that is you know, probably the reason why we stick, the earth is still very, very productive. And everywhere I go, I see, you know, like fruits, you know, uh, produce and grains and fruits and everything, you know, it, it's like, it is still like the Garden of Eden for the most part. Yes, we have some deserts and we have some other, you know, un unproductive areas, but generally speaking, the earth is very rich and it's very, very productive because God has said in his heart that he wouldn't curse it, Okay that he were not going to curse it any further than it had already been cursed as it happened in the days of Adam. Okay, For the imagination of man's heart is evil. And why was this curse brought upon the earth? Because man's heart had turned to evil as it happened to Adam in the garden Okay, and to his children. Okay? The imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. So God is not going to, yes, there is going to be much destruction and the greater judgment of this world which is going to follow. But even then, the promise is, as God said, that he is going to save some flesh, that he is going to cut the day short, lest all flesh should be destroyed, because he said that to himself here, that he was not going to smite everyone from off the face of the earth ever again. While the earth remaineth, Seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Okay, So while the earth remains, seasons and uh, you know time to plant and time to sow and time to reap 
and the summers and winters, daytime and nighttime, it is not going to stop. And it hasn't and it won't until the day that this earth is no more. All right, my dear friends, so that is what God said in his heart. Okay, He said that to himself. This is not God talking to Noah. So the covenant that God would make with Noah is going to be in chapter 9, which I will continue studying in the next uh, meeting.